1992, composer and lyricist William Fenn won two Tony Awards for his Broadway debut, Falsettos. At the same time, however, he was battling a life-threatening brain condition. During the long recovery process that followed, he began writing songs to help him through his ordeal. With the help of his friend Jane Plapine, Finn has finished and fashioned those songs into a musical, A New Brain. Joining me tonight, direct and choreographer Graciela Daniel, the show's star Malcolm Getz, and its creator William Finn. I'm pleased to have each of them here. Welcome. It's great to see you again. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. The, you went into the hospital three days after your last appearance. It was because of you, Charlie. <laughs> That's <laughs> what the doctors didn't well, know. That, but you know what that means? That means that I'm responsible for this. <laughs> <laughs> you owe me. It's absolutely true. <laughs> Royalties. Tell, let's go back to the accepting the Tony Awards and when you first began Where to I was say, incredibly inarticulate. Yeah. Where I, which I blame on my brain thing. No one knows that. But, uh... I was, uh, for, for a while, for, for about a year, I had been uh, collapsing in the street and um, I, <laughs> just losing my mind half the time. And everyone thought it was uh, because I was turning 40. <laughs> <laughs> Every, and, and it wasn't. They said, Finn's okay as soon as he gets to be past 40. Well, and, and then I turned 40, and then, uh, and then I opened the show. <laughs> I opened the show, and it was still happening. Yeah. And, and so there was a little disquiet, but... It was because of the anxiety of opening the show, then the Tony Awards, then I get the Tony Awards, and I was really afraid that I was going to collapse. What would, what would happen is, is I would just get lightheaded, and then I'd have to sit down. If I was sitting down for a long time and, and I'd stand up, I'd have to s sit down on the, the side of the road or sit down in a seat in the theater if I was walking down the aisle. And this was happening over and over again. And, and uh, I went to see a therapist, and the therapist said, I really think you should see a doctor. And my doctor had just died. And so I went to see my eye doctor finally, who uh, I said, you know, I've been trying to get a reservation here, an appointment here for a long time. Your secretary's a witch. You have to fire her. And I'm going to, if something's wrong with me, I'm going to cause problems. And he looks in my eyes, and he comes back in. He says, cancel everything. Your life is on hold now. He said, you're going to the hospital tomorrow. Just by the, an observation. You see in my, I, 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 had, I was turning blind. I could see a, a tiny, tiny bit out, out of my eye. But the fact is, I was denying this all during, you know, finally I got a show on Broadway, finally the Tonys, and so I denied the whole thing. It was, it was ridiculous, and you everyone was letting me. I, my dear friends, they were all saying, oh, you're so crazy. <laughs> you know? Nothing wrong with you no. except a little anxiety That's about right. everything. Uh, and so then what happened? Then I was told I had an inoperable brain tumor. Not exactly. I, the doctor is looking at the things and he says, um, I'm, I'm making a joke of it with a friend who was there with me. And I, and I said, I think it's very bad. And he said, yeah, it is. Uh, it's you see this, it's an eloquent part of the brain. Uh, it controls a lot of movement and thinking. It's in the brain stem, an eloquent part of the brain. And I said, uh, well, can you give me any hope? I said, any, any, you can give me any hope. Just give me any hope. And he just looked at the thing and looked at the thing and looked at the thing. And I said, it's very bad. And he said, uh, it's very bad. So when I accused him of telling me he, I had an inoperable brain tumor a month later, he said, I never said that. I said, I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think you did without saying it. You, you gave me no hope. So how come you're sitting here today? Um, because <laughs> I was lucky enough to have a thing called an AVM, which is a, a potentially terrible thing, but they got it in time, even though it hemorrhaged. I then went down to Virginia for this miraculous thing, surgery, uh, called gamma knife radiation, uh, which 10 years ago I, I, I couldn't have had. I mean, I had to go to Virginia from New York City to get it because that's where they did it excellently. And I was lucky enough um, over a three-year period to have it uh, cured. And how are you today? <laughs> uh, the, the doctor, uh, the doctor, two, three years later, sent me a note saying that uh, 
everything's gone and William Finn will live an absolutely normal life, which shocked all my friends. <laughs> Considering I'd never oh, lived said, a normal life no, before. No, no, but, um, they said, you know, oh, no, Finn is back. <laughs> so, I guess it's all right. So how does this become a play? A La musical at that. Lapine would come to the hospital and he'd say, write everything down. And I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, you stupid ass, I'm dying. <laughs> I'm I, I don't know what you're talking about. You're thinking about you know, play. I am <laughs> dying, <laughs> and he's saying, write everything down. <laughs> I, I said, what am I going to, give me a time to write it. Because we thought it was a brain tumor when he was saying, write everything down. But uh, I was lucky enough, when I came out of the hospital, I would just, I, I, I was tipping over for a while, and, and I, I, I couldn't walk very well. And... Once I had the hemorrhage, hemorrhage, I started tipping over. And then, I, uh, so I couldn't move around too well. So I had to sit at the piano. It was a very good <laughs> thing to make me work. So it was therapy. It was uh, physical therapy, mental therapy. And I would sit at the piano, and all of a sudden, these songs were just coming. They, they were just flying out of the piano. And I was just there writing them down, writing them, and, and the, the phones would ring, and I was just there writing it. It was unbelievable, because this doesn't happen. I'm just sitting there writing it. I'm in, and, and a lot of those songs, and this happened over about a two-month period, and a lot of those songs are kind of the heart, heart and soul of the show. Like which one? like and they're off or the law of genetics heart and music i feel so much spring time all came within that that uh how did you get involved in that? well um billy called me about probably what was it, about four years ago three years ago and he said to me um have a, i have some songs to play for you so i went with uh, with ira weitzman who works for lincoln center too, and i sat in his studio and i started listening to the song and i was so moved well, I always, you know, loved his work, but it, it was so, it, it, they were incredibly moving. And I said, well, well what do you want to do with this? It's extraordinary. He says, well, maybe a review. I said, a review about hospital? And I'm like, I, I don't think so. Well, it was a different sort of well, review. Well, well, <laughs> you know? I, I don't know. But anyway, yeah. we know that he's, uh, you know, he's, he, yeah. he, so, so I, I thought, well, you know, let's put it in an order. I mean, let's see, let's see if it is a cycle of songs. And we tried it, and we did a little reading with that. And uh, we, I kept on feeling, it's, it's a story that has to be told. It's a, it, it, not a story, but, but a, an event, uh, you know, an experience. Yeah. And, uh, this is life and death, you can tell this story. Yes. And, and with his approach to it, yeah. just humorous and, you know, never sentimental. And, and so we, I, I said, look, we need James. We need the one who's oh. made you do it, <laughs> you know what I mean? We need, because James is extraordinary to work with, with Billy, because he needs structure and yeah. he guides and learn it. So James came in and started working with Billy. And then we did a workshop at Lingo Center. We put it together with Malcolm. That's when Malcolm joined us. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's, that's, that's when one learns what one has. And we had made a lot of mistakes, but we learned from it. And yeah. then we did another reading, and here we are. And, and I'll get to Malcolm in a second, but what, what was it that came out of you and Jane Lapine working together? A couple of... Lapine more than anything else, and he's a, a brilliant structure and a wonderful writer and everything, but what he does for me is he's, he's, he has a very fertile mind, and if, if I say, I don't know what to write here, I have an idea, he says, well, what if you say this? 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 And it's not necessarily words that will be used in the songs, but they're just things to get me unstuck and get me rolling. And, and so he, he can always do that. Yeah. And I can get stuck for weeks or months at a time and not know what to do. So it's, it's enormous luxury, enormous luxury. They have a stimulus. Well, to have uh, a uh, tablet of pine. Uh, he's he's right. just uh, <laughs> extraordinary. And so, Malcolm, you get a call at some point in this, and they're saying, what, come? <clears throat> Two years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. I'd worked with Graziella before, and, uh, <clears throat> yeah, and they, the first, did, you'd done one workshop without me right here before. No, it was just a, uh, like a reading. A reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we did the workshop two years ago, and uh, we worked for like four weeks, rehearsed for three weeks, and did three performances, and... Uh, and that was even an amazing experience. I mean, the day before we did the first performance of the preview, we had all sort of taken for granted that I was a composer and I also played the piano, so we had that. And the day before we did the first workshop, Andre Bishop said, the audience doesn't understand what kind of a writer he is. So we would improvise, <laughs> we improvised things in the first workshops yeah. where I'd literally go out of the piano. I remember because the first day I improvised it with the first audience, it went great, and the second day it didn't go well. 
and Billy started yelling at me, and I was like, No, 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 I had given you, I gave you lyrics to do, and you decided not to sing the lyrics the second day. That's exactly what happened. With the lyrics, you were fine. So you're saying he was good with your lyrics, but without your lyrics, it wasn't so good. He's a very talented writer, actor. However, in this case... <laughs> oh, in this okay. case... The I think were very specific. Dan Yankee's reference, that's what happened. Was what, so anyway, that's mm -hmm. so it. He needed those words, didn't he? But the show has changed so much. Yeah, in, how has it changed? Society. When we did the workshop, all of the stuff about the illness was all very representational, like none of it was literal. And then this summer, we realized we needed to spell it out more for the audience. So now, like, I'm in a wheelchair and I have a bandage on my head. Well, and it's, it's also that when I started writing it, I wrote it as a documentary. Everything was true. It was, I, I thought it was weird to do a musical documentary, because the documentary is done live. And music, you have to sit and write, and then someone learns it. And so it's obviously not a doc But I wanted everything to be factual. And it turned out to be too complicated. It's hard to write in musical terms about, um, oh, I forget all the words, <laughs> but gluing the veins and, and yeah. explaining gamma knife radiation in the lyrics is just tedious after a while. And, and people saying, I don't care, I don't care. Does he get better? <laughs> How, you know? So we, we simplified yeah. a lot of the, we, a lot of the work was just making it all comprehensible and understandable. But that's basically what we learned in the workshop, actually, mm -hmm. that, that the illness itself was not what the show was about. Right. Uh -huh. That it was more of, what, of the experience of this, of this person, how yeah. to, to get through this event and how he came out at the end. Right. And plus the extraordinary moments where his fantasy goes and uh -huh. he starts writing the songs he wishes he could have been before dying. And that's, that, that was the best part always. Uh -huh. And that's what we learned through the workshop that we had to get rid of some of the, all this the information, medical, the medical the information. information. Nobody would. And make the story of what? Uh, it's a show about songs. Uh, so about yeah, songs. Yeah. Yeah. About, about resurrection. Uh, 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 and about hope and gratitude hope, and learning yes, how to live and yes. learning how not to sweat the small stuff. And exactly. Just kind of. Now, is this line in here where you say, is there any hope? Can't you give me any hope? Did that make it? Never made it. No, no, no. No, no, Are you no. saying it tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be thinking it. I'll be thinking it. I'll look at Chris and I'll be thinking it. Let's see if it works. <laughs> no, Material no, venous no. malformation. Is there any hope? Can you give me any hope? Use it. James will come. He'll be like, he's picking up his dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> now, what would happen if you did that? <laughs> well. He gets notes. Yeah. Yeah. You get notes? Yeah. Somebody would write, you know, every night you get a note about your performance? Well, I must say that one night you I actually... you send little notes to it? No, no. But there was something that I said, like as an ad lib, that became a lyric, which I was kind of happy what about. What that? When I said, you're going to take off the top of my head, and then later you wrote that, tomorrow you'll strap me down, and I'm going to remove that, the top of my I've head. I've got to tell you that I wrote that uh, two summers ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we well, just I stuck it in. It on. <laughs> we stuck it in. And in fact, I prefer another lyric for that, but we, we could what talk about it. What do you prefer? Uh, tomorrow... They're gonna screw with my brain. Then we'll count how many neurons remain, which is why now I think so. Oh, good. I love you and like remove the top of my head. Because the first time we talked about craniotomy, I thought that, that like that's where well, my that, brain that's why we just like they're gonna take that's off what it was that. about. And it's so you know, and that's I think it's so it shocking yeah. for the audience too. I, I like the remo the count how many neurons remain amuses me, but you know what? What? It's a democracy. Tell me, yeah, Diane, that's why this is interesting. This is really about collaboration. Now tell me what you think this is about. What I think it's about, and I hate this question, Charlie. Why? Because I, I write these shows so I don't have to know what they're about. <laughs> uh, or I don't have to explain what they're about. Just but I, explain I, I, I it for me. I think what it's about is, is gratitude and getting a second chance and not wasting. And tell me about that. I mean, I, that's fascinating to me. I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I think that's what the show's about. Um, Gratitude and getting a second chance and the celebration of that opportunity. And, and learning to, to live well with that second chance. This is a stupid question, but do you feel in your life today so very different because of what, how perilously close you came to losing it all? I, I, there's a lyric that we, the last thing I wrote in this is, everything's changed, but nothing's changed. The world is different, but it's still the same. 
I still complain, but it's not the same as I was. But I'm not the same that I was, except I'm the same that I was, but different. You know, and, and that's what it's about. Yeah.